Okay, this is our sixth lecture, and we're going to start out just by introducing uh, the opening of the first four seals in Revelations chapter 6, and then we're going to refer back to the Olivet Discourse from Jesus and in with uh, Zechariah 12 verses, uh, I mean, Zechariah chapters 12 through 14. And I'm going to break this video up in two parts to make it a little more, uh, uh, I guess, easier to watch. So first and foremost, the first four seals. That's what we're going to start at. And we're just going to introduce the four seals. We're not going to discuss them at length. We'll do that later. But if you recall, we have now have finished chapters 4, the throne room, chapter 5, the formal ceremony of handing over the, uh, the scroll with the seven seals, and now the Lamb, the Messiah, the Son of Man, our Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to start tearing off the seals. All right? And the first four seals are going to re release the famous four horsemen. Uh, and this is going to be resulting in humans doing bad things to other humans. And we'll, we'll get into a little more of those details. But it's all going to be with the help of Satan because <clears throat> Satan is also going to be released uh, to, um, to really start doing bad things. And ultimately, though, this is God. God is sovereignly allowing man to express all the evil that they're capable of doing. It's almost like going back to the days of Noah or the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, where um, the evil in man was basically running unchecked. And then everything after the fifth seal, that's going to be God doing things against unbelievers. So let's go ahead and introduce the four horsemen. Revelation 6, verse 1. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. And then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. So this is the beginning. This is the beginning of God granting Satan the authority to make war against God's elect, that is the Jewish people and the saints. And you say, wow, giving the authority. We've read about that before, haven't we? Yes, we have. And Job, uh, Job uh, was a, a very similar set of circumstances where um, the Lord said to Satan, this is Job 1, verse 8, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? And then uh, Satan answered the Lord and said, <clears throat> Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and, the possess and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And we know how that story played down. Satan uh, destroyed everything that Job owned. Uh, he even killed his family, his servants. Uh, and then he went back to God complaining, well, you're not allowing me to touch Job. And uh, God says, okay, you can flick uh, painful sores on him. And um, we know what happened. After all this pain and tribulation, God was given the glory. And Job uh, was blessed many times over as a result of all this. So anyway, we got the first rider. He's on a white horse. He has a bow. Um, but we're not seeing arrows. Okay, well, the bow at least represents potential strength. And lots of times it's that potential strength 
that uh, gives politicians that political power that they need to, uh, to go on their campaign. So it's not a military event here. It's not military power. That's usually represented by the sword. But another very, very important part of this is that the white horse, the rider on the white horse, he was given a crown. This is not something that he achieved on his own accomplishments. This is not something that he was born into, like royalty. Um, this is not his power or his authority. This has been given to him, released by God, given by Satan, um, the Antichrist. So let's read on. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. So we're seeing all four of these living creatures playing a role here. And then another horse came out, and this one was a fiery one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. And to him was given a large sword. So this rider, uh, not only he has a sword, but it is a large sword. And then once again, this rider was given power to take peace from the earth. So what was this power given? Well, obviously it's military machinery uh, and then also probably uh, just the power of, of allegiances. But how is this all going to go down? Well, let me just give you one example uh, on, on given power. Uh, let's use the recent example of the Taliban that made a, uh, a move in Afghanistan, and in 10 days' time, they were basically able to take over the country without any real military conflict. They were able to see the president flee the country. They were able to see the world's most powerful army, uh, the United States military, uh, turn tail and run. And not only did they evacuate from Afghanistan, but what? They left all their sophisticated weapons behind. And all of a sudden, the Taliban was given a large sword. Now, I'm not necessarily saying this is the, the uh, horseman on the fiery red one, but then again, it could be. Um, so we don't know. But what we do know is that something happened that I think was even bigger than politics. So what do we expect to see from the red horse, the fiery red one? War, military campaigns, possibly war that will uh, be far more significant than even World War II. Let's read on. Verse 5, when the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse, its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages. And do not damage the oil and the wine. Now, obviously we'll unpack this at a later date, but in introducing this, what's the expectation? The expectation uh, from the, the outcome of the third seal of the black horse uh, which is typical from large-scale wars, is that what? There will be supply chains that will be uh, destroyed. There will be crops that will be destroyed. There will be a massive food storage, correction, a massive food shortage and famine across the world. And with such shortages of food, well, guess what? You will be able possibly to buy it on the black market. And the price of food is going to escalate. It's going to skyrocket. And that's if, it's, it can, if it can even be found. And probably what will be found will be pretty basic. Let's read on. Verse 7. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. 
they, the both of them, were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by wild beasts of the earth. Now, once again, these are writers that were given power, given power to kill over a fourth of the earth. Okay, who do you think they would go after? Do you think they're going to go after the worldly people? No. Do you think they're going to go after those that are going to align themselves with the, the prince of this world? No. These writers are going to go after the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, uh, Jerusalem, and Christians, the church. And guess what? About a quarter of the earth of the world's population are either Jews or true Christians. So this is going to start the tribulation. The consequences will be horrific. Not only physically, with lots of killings, mass killings, beheadings, uh, burnings, but there is a potential of spiritual death as well. Hades. For anyone that disavows their belief and trust in Jesus Christ. It will be a very, very sad uh, chapter in human history. So... Let's just quickly review. We got the four horsemen now. They were all given power. So it's, it's a releasing uh, by God to allow Satan to start doing his work on the world, um, ultimately to, for the glory of God. Uh, but Satan is going to be driven by hatred, by blind hatred. It will not be by power. Uh, it, it will not be uh, a search for power or a search for wealth. It will be, he will be driven by hatred as well as the Antichrist, the false prophet. These, uh, so we got power given to the white horse, uh, the conqueror been on conquest. Uh, he's going to be, uh, for lack of better words, a political broker uh, that will convince uh, Israel and other nations into enter into agreements. Uh, the red horse, um, that's going to launch the military campaign. The black horse is going to be the resulting famine um, and the escalating prices of food. The pale horse is going to go after God's people to kill physically by sword, famine, plague, disease. And remember, this is a battle for souls. So they're going to be given power to kill spiritually as well um, to anyone that they can coerce into um, swearing allegiance to the Antichrist. So is this anything new? Have we have already uh, been warned this by prophecies uh, and, and uh, prophets of old? And the answer is resounding yes. This is the reason why it's so important that we understand Old Testament prophecies before really getting in to the thick of things in Revelation. Uh, this is the reason why Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I came what? To fulfill. So let's look at three major prophecies. Ezekiel 14, verse 21. <clears throat> For thus says the Lord God, Yahweh, how much more when I sin upon Jerusalem? So this is God venting his anger, not against the enemies of his chosen people, but his anger against his people, his chosen people. How much more when I sin upon Jerusalem? My four disastrous acts of judgment. Sword, famine, wild beasts, pestilence, Mm, I think we're already reading a bit about that. To cut off from it man and beast. But behold, some survivors will be left. There is always a remnant. Uh, and when you see their ways and their deeds, and you shall know that I have not done without cause all that I've done in it, declares the Lord God. Now the verse in front of it, verse 20, also gives a, 
uh, a very um, important lesson here. Even if Noah, even if Daniel, even if Job was amongst you guys, if they were in it, as I live, declares the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness. So this is like a reenactment of Sodom and Gomorrah all over again, or a reenactment of Noah, where only Noah and his family were saved. Leviticus 26, verse 18. Once again, this is God venting his anger against his own people. If in spite of this, you, my Jewish chosen ones, will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold. I will break the pride of your power. Your land shall not yield its increase and the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. I will let loose the wild beasts against you. I will bring a sword upon you. I will send pestilence among you and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. Women shall bake your bread in a single oven and shall dole out your bread again by weight. That's like a day's wages for a day's measure of wheat or barley. And you shall eat and not be satisfied. Very haunting words. Deuteronomy 32, starting verse 22. For a fire is kindled by my anger, and it burns to the depths of Sheol. Sheol is the Hebrew version of Hades in Greek. It burns to the depths of Sheol, devours the earth and its increase, and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap disasters upon them. Who's the them? I will spend my arrows on them. They shall be wasted with hunger and devoured by plague and poisonous pestilence. I will send the teeth of beasts against them. The venom of things that crawl in the dust. Outdoors the sword shall bereave and indoors terror for young men and women alike. And so who's the them? Well, that's explained in the verses in front, verses 15 through 20. It is against, once again, the children of Israel forsaking their God. God had promised immense promise, uh, uh, immense uh, blessings if they accept him as their God. And then he gave this warning that if you do not accept me, things are gonna go very, very uh, bad and painful for you. Uh, one thing to keep in mind in all these is that God's heart in all this is not to destroy. It's not to destroy. His heart is for repentance and to coming back to him for reconciliation, which he would immensely bless. That's the heart of God. Remember, he wants a family. He wants a relationship. Okay, now having said that, I need to introduce a very important word, a, a New Testament Greek noun. It's called parousia. And parousia, uh, in, when it's translated in English, it's usually translated as a verb um, coming. But parousia is a noun, and it means an arrival and a continuing presence. Okay, so uh, in one sense, uh, parousia is a new chapter in the history of mankind, all right? It's the Greek word that's behind the second coming, but it is much, much more. Um, as we will see, it is a whole set of complex actions that are, that are going to be undertaken. In the New Testament, uh, when it's associated with our Jesus' second coming uh, and all that happens, the day of the Lord, it's always singular, it's never plural. So in other words, it's only, it's a single event. 
It's not like Jesus is going to come and maybe rescue his people and then he's going to go back up and then uh, maybe seven years later he's going to come down again and start this uh, campaign of tribulation and pouring out of, of uh, uh, sounding of trumpets and pouring out of bowls. That's not the case. It's a single event. It's Jesus' arrival in the clouds, the cloud rider. It's the resurrection of the dead. Uh, it's the rapture of those that are still alive on his arrival. It's the day of the Lord's wrath. Day being, shall we say in parentheses, because it's much more than a day. It is bringing the remnant of Israel to salvation, the new covenant. It's establishing his earthly rule. Uh, and with that, there's also his judgment and his rewards. And then most importantly, there's the wedding. The bride of Christ the wedding feast. Now, this is not a uh, unknown word amongst the uh, New Testament believers uh, in the early church. Believers were instructed to make Jesus' uh, parousia the object of expectation. And so let's look at some examples of that. Uh, uh, we'll look at three examples in Thessalonians. First Thessalonians 2.19. Well, what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ at his parousia? It is not at his coming. Is it not for you? Chapter three, verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in the holiness before our God and Father at the parousia, the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. Chapter five, verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming, at the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ. James 5, 7, he instructs us to be patient, therefore, brothers, until the parousia of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the parousia of the Lord is at hand. The coming of the Lord is at hand. The, remember the gospel message is what? The coming kingdom of God. That's what everybody is longing for and, and that's where the expectations are. Second Peter 3, verse 11. What sort of people ought you be in, li in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the parousia, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. First John 2, 28, and now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his parousia. So this is not a um, unknown word amongst the early church. So now that we know this word <clears throat> in the background behind the four horsemen and the introduction of the four horsemen, let's compare this to what Jesus' own teaching is on the end of the age, which is found in the Olivet Discourse. And the most comprehensive recording is found in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, the Olivet Discourse and Jesus talking about end times. Now he had given some teachings throughout his ministry, but the last week is where the teaching gets real serious. In fact, everything Jesus does during the last week um, is very, very important to him. So he comes in on a donkey, on a, on a colt. Uh, he gives his final sermon to the public. That's found in Matthew 22. Uh, this is what would be the subject most near and dear to him. The kingdom of heaven 
may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And we know how that parable goes with the ending of many are called, but few are chosen. And then there was his final message to religious leaders of the day. You would think it would be a word of encouragement to persevere, to, to run the course, but no, it was quite the opposite. It was a blistering series of rebukes. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And seven times he pronounced woes on the religious leaders. He laments over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. And then he foretells the destruction of the temple, which we will read. And in all of this is going on, his disciples are getting really concerned. What's going on here, Lord? And so they come to him with some very pointed questions. So let's read this. Matthew 24, verse three. As he sat down on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Master, Jesus, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? What will be the sign of your parousia? And the end of the age. And Jesus answered them. Okay, first and foremost, the disciples came asking three specific things. And when will these things be? Well, what were these things? Well, it's what they had already seen um, during the day, maybe even the day before when Jesus was lashing out at the, at the religious leaders, calling them a brood of vipers, telling them, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? This is serious words coming from the Son of God. Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes and some whom you will kill and crucify and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. Wow. He goes on to say, truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. See your house is left to you desolate. He's speaking of the temple. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So in other words, until Jesus is, is welcomed as the Messiah of the Jewish people. And then we know um, uh, what he also told his disciples, um, where he says, you see all these things, do you not? True, and he's speaking of the temple. Um, truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So yeah, the, the disciples, they, they had some serious questions uh, that they wanted to ask. So when will these things be? What is the sign of your coming? What is the sign of the end of age? And what's the first thing that comes from Jesus' mouth? See that no one leads you astray. Wow. So what he's saying is get ready. There's gonna be a wealth of opinions, interpretations, messages, and synagogues messages uh, across the pulpit and church. Do not be misled. And when he says, see that, that means it's action on your part. Do your part, be Berean, read the scriptures, know and understand the, the scriptures. Because the enemy does not want us to understand what, hap what will happen. He does not want us to be prepared. He wants to be able to pull the carpet out from under us uh, so that in his mind, hopefully we will lose faith in what we have put our faith and hope and trust in. The enemy is committed to leading each and every one of us astray. Verse five, 
for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Okay, once again, this is where um, it'd been nice if um, the word Christ was not transliterated, but it was actually translated. Uh, the word Christos, it has basically two different meanings. It could be mean anointed, like I am anointed by God to give you this message, or the, the anointed one himself, the Messiah. Now, yes, there will be many coming, claiming to be the Messiah, which will be a false Messiah, but more probable because Jesus Christ says many will come in my name. Well, in my name really is pointing to what? Christians. Those that acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and Messiah. Christians, we carry his name. So there's going to be an, uh, false teachers. There's going to be false apostles. There's going to be false um, messages coming across the pulpit. Uh, from people, from teachers, from pastors that claim to be anointed by God to teach uh, this personal message that God gave me, uh, that will be false. That will be misleading. That will be slightly altered. That will sound right, but the end can be very, very dangerous and very, very misleading. And regrettably, Satan is alive and well in the church today. There's a lot of key messages and teachings that are just dangerous. I'll give you one quick example. Uh, there's a teaching that because God is love, there will be no punishment. There will be no hell. Because God is love, he will reward those that believe in him with heaven, and those who do not, he'll just destroy them to the point where they cease to exist. Annihilation. They will never know they ever existed. There will be no pain. There will be no suffering. They'll just cease to exist. Very, very dangerous teaching. Because there's a lot of people that look out on the world and say, you know what, the world just sucks. I just wish I didn't even exist. And they will be led down this broad path to destruction, thinking that they, they could just live it up, be it eat, drink, and be merry, or the drug scene, or, or, or whatever, because in the end, it just doesn't matter. They'll cease to exist, and they're fine with that. A dangerous, dangerous teaching. Okay, Jesus goes on, verse six. <clears throat> and you will hear of wars and rumor of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. Okay, so wars and rumors of wars. Well, there's nothing new there. A good example of a rumor of war would be Iran and, and Israel. They're at war with each other. Okay, tell us something new. It's not necessarily an actual war. It's a rumor of a war. But verse 7, verse 7, once again, the English does not do this justice because if you go back into the original language, it is ethnos. Ethnos will rise against ethnos. So it's not nations. It's not, it's not geopolitical maps that we see on state. Uh, uh, it's, geopolitical states that we see on maps, <clears throat> it will be ethnic groups against ethnic groups. And an example would be uh, Islam against Christians or against Jews. Um, that would be good examples of ethnic groups. Um, and then, yes, there will also be kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. So we're seeing that today. But does that mean the end is in sight? Not necessarily. He goes on in verse 8. 
All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Okay, what are the, what is the beginning of birth pains? Because we're not talking birth pains. Well, maybe yes, we are. When my wife was pregnant uh, with our first child, I learned a very important word: Braxton Hicks. What's Braxton Hicks? Well, we're like one evening she's sitting on the couch and it's like, ooh, I think that's a contraction. That had a little, behind, a little pain behind it. That would be the beginning of birth pains because we know what happens later. The contractions start getting closer and closer and closer. The pain starts ratcheting up and up and up to where it is sharp pains, close, violent contractions. This is the body preparing the birth canal for birth a new life. And this is a perfect comparison to the birth of God's kingdom that will only come after there is much pain, after there is much tribulation, birth pains. But what comes after birth is gonna be a new child and all of a sudden it's like all that pain that was experienced, all that trauma, it's like, oh, I forgot all about that because I'm now looking at a beautiful child of my own flesh and blood. Um, the same for God's kingdom. After all that pain and tribulation and refining, baptism and fire will come everlasting joy of a new kingdom where there's no pain or sorrow or suffering or sin um, or evil politicians or scamming phone calls. The list just goes on and on and on. Everlasting joy. That's the gospel message the coming kingdom of God. Let's read on. <clears throat> then, a very important word, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Well, what's the then? Well, the then is what we just talked about. A very, very important word, a very important transition. Um, after we see these false Christs. We see ethnic groups rising against ethnic groups, uh, kingdoms against kingdoms. Uh, after we see famines and earthquake, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So once again, this is a very pointed uh, uh, warning against Christians because it is Christians that are carrying the namesake of Jesus Christ, but then it's also the Jewish people because they're carrying the name of what? God the Father, Yahweh. So um, there's going to be a, a outpouring of hatred and persecution and martyrdom um, that we have never seen before. And Jesus will elaborate on that. So let's read in verse 10. And then many, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many to astray. So we're seeing the, the word many used quite a bit here, three times in fact. Many are going to fall away. Many are going to betray one another. Many is going to hate one another. There'll be many false prophets. Uh, there, will, there will lead many astray. And then verse 12, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of what? Many will grow cold. Okay, well, let's look at this word lawlessness. What does that mean? Well, lawlessness could mean uh, a national government uh, turning a blind eye on reforcing their own rule of law legislated law, or for us, the Constitution of the United States, just ignoring it. It could also be on an international scene of UN uh, disregarding their own resolutions or countries, um, uh, alliances or coalitions in the past, uh, agreements have been made, being thrown out the window. So are we seeing any of this now? 
How about, for example, the political response of using the coronavirus, the pandemic, to control and prohibit what has been um, constitutional rights? That can be seen as a type in the shadow of what yet to come, right? What we're already seeing with the coronavirus is already attacking the church. Uh, many churches being told, you cannot meet together to worship God. Wow. Uh, in fact, more and more, uh, as we see our nation and the world calling good evil and evil good, uh, Christians are being labeled as what? Fanatics. So the question is, is the Western church ready and prepared? I mean, after all, the Eastern church has been experiencing persecution and martyrdom for years. How about us in the good old United States? How are we gonna to respond to these ethnic group pressures? Because the day may very well come when we have a decision to make and that decision is going to determine life or death or eternal life and eternal death. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. I know for me, I know exactly what I'm going to say. I am mentally and spiritually prepared to say, I choose to obey God rather than man. And if it means death, so be it. If it means I don't have access to food or, or travel or, or, or housing or whatever, so be it. If it means um, being thrown into prison, if it means uh, being shot there right on, right on the spot, so be it. I choose to serve God. We need to be ready. And then Jesus kind of seals this with verse 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Remember, salvation is at the end of the narrow pathway that leads to salvation. Destruction is at the end of the broad path that leads to destruction. This is a heavy statement in the context of end times. Because Jesus is laying out a message of, you know what? You're not gonna be rescued, at least not physically. This is a message that we're gonna to have, to, you're gonna to have to endure, you're gonna to have to persevere, because I have a plan that's gonna give glory to God and also uh, refine a glorious church. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom, which is gonna be a role of the church, especially during these times, will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So does this mean that the onus is on us, the church, that until we have preached the gospel to everyone in the world, the end does not come? No. But what it does mean is that the tribulation is gonna drive and ramp up the church's efforts on evangelizing. And I believe the church will usher in many, many into the kingdom of God, uh, showing the ways and means of salvation through Jesus Christ. However, in the end, there will still be uh, people groups and people that need to hear the gospel and angels will finish that mission. In Revelation 14, now first of all, let's set the, the scene in Revelation 14. We've already had all six seals that have been ripped up. We've already uh, have uh, trumpets uh, being sounded out. Uh, things are going fast and furious with cosmic signs, with, uh, with uh, an outlash, an outpouring of God's wrath that cannot be explained scientifically, cannot be explained by forces of nature, cannot even be explained by forces of man. This has to be God 
oh my goodness, there is a God and he is angry. And then in the midst of all this, there will be a majestic being flying through the sky. And it says in Revelation 14, 6, then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an internal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice so that all could hear, fear God, give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is, this is the heart of God. He's always leaving an open door, an open invitation for, for mankind to come to him, to be part of his kingdom. This is like the last invitation that's being sent. Let's read on. So when you see, now Jesus is saying, okay, we got, uh, we got a whole bunch of things that are happening. And when you see the abomination, so this is gonna be the trigger. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, that would be the temple. Let the reader understand. So Jesus doesn't go into all the details. Basically he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, oh, by the way, that's all explained in the prophet Daniel. Uh, so for us, we need to read Daniel. We need to read Daniel's uh, chapter two, chapter seven, chapter eight, chapter nine, chapters 10, 11, 12. These are all eschatological uh, key messages in Daniel. Let the reader understand. So what's Jesus saying? He's expecting us to read Daniel. Let the reader understand. It's all in Daniel. You're expected to read Daniel. That's how important it is. Let's read on. Then, another important word, another transition. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let one who's on the housetop not go down and take what's in his house and let the one that's in the field not turn back and take his cloak. Um, and alas, for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter. Why? Because it's cold. Or on a Sabbath. Why? Well, because you have these uh, Orthodox Jews that they're not going to move because that would mean violating a Sabbath law if they were to run and they will be slaughtered. Pray that your flight will not be in winter. Oh, let me see. Verse 21. For then... Then, what's then? When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, then there will be a great tribulation such as not been seen from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. So there will be a tribulation uh, that we have never seen before in history. Okay, and what Jesus Christ is saying is that when you see that abomination of desolation, um, that immediately behind it is going to be a gathering of nations that have uh, formed alliance uh, with the Antichrist against Jerusalem. There will be invasion. Uh, there will also, when you run out to the wilderness, there will be a wilderness encounter with God. We're not going to get into it today, but that's found in Hosea, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and revelation for starters. It'll be like a second exodus. Very sobering warning and set of circumstances that Jesus says is going to come to the last generation. Verse 22, and if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. 
but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. So there's going to be signs and wonders that will deceive even the elect. If, if they're not prepared, if they have not read the prophecies in the Old Testament, if they have not read Revelation, because without this knowledge, man is gullible. See, I have told you beforehand. So one thing for certain, we need to read Daniel as well as Revelation, as well as just knowing all the scripture. Remember, Jesus Christ says, I came not to abolish the law and prophets, but to fulfill it. So what are some of these false signs and wonders? Well, 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. Wow, well, what, what does that mean? Well, expand a little more, Revelation 13, 11. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It performs great signs, even making fire coming down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, the Antichrist, so we're talking the false prophet here, it deceives those who dwell on earth. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. And it's surprising how so many Christians will go, oh, that's the mark of the beast, or oh, like, I took the vaccine. Is that the mark of the beast? Am I now doomed? It's like, come on, read scripture. For starters, verse 16 and 17 doesn't happen until you see verses 13, 14, and 15. So if, if we know what to expect, if we know what's the difference between false signs and true signs, which we're going to get into, then we will not be deceived. Very, very important. Okay, we're going to end there. And uh, then I'm going to pick up uh, with the remainder of uh, this presentation in a separate video.